Uh, as Gabriel said, um, I'm a senior principal engineer on the team, so no marketing. Uh, get nice and technical, hopefully. Uh, how many people use or know what RDS is? So most everybody knows, so we don't have to cover any of that. How many people use RDS today? Cool, great, yeah. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is essentially going over what we've been doing lately with Postgres uh, as an RDS engine. Uh, it's a, it was our fourth engine, but it's, uh, it's very popular with our customers. And we've made a lot of uh, improvements over the last year and a bit. And I'm going to talk about what's changed as well as the lessons sort of we've learned when working with customers, you know, running Postgres. So one of the big news is, was last week we uh, did another release. So we released uh, 936 which you know, just has the, the normal 9.3 fixes in it. Um, but we also had a small bug in our, uh, how we do our security stuff, because we have a different super user role. We actually had a problem if you tried to do reset all, it killed your connection. So that was, that was kind of bad. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we fixed that in 9.3.6, so you, know, you can do a minor version upgrade uh, if, if you use reset all. Lots of our customers don't and never notice, so and we'll continue to not care. Um, and then the other big announcement was that we now support 9.4. We released 9.4.1 with all that goodness that all of you probably know and love around JSONB and index improvements. Uh, we, we added the new PG pre-warm extension that came with uh, 9.4 and support for it. And then we bundled new versions of PLV8 and PostGIS with the version. So our, kind of our philosophy is we don't tend to bump up the new versions a lot in, the, you know, in each major release. So we, on the major releases, we want to get up to the current versions on those. So. So let's talk a little bit about data movement. We get a lot of customers you know, asking us questions about how to move data in or out of RDS. So I wanted to cover that. So one of the big ones is, you know, how do you first load data? Well, you'll see you know, a lot of these remarks are similar to what you would see for any database and any kind of service where you want to turn off the things that are overheads while you're doing your data loading. For us, disabling backups, setting your backup retention to zero, is pretty important. Uh, disabling our multi-Z, our high availability strategy, because that's going to slow things down a little bit when you're doing bulk loading. And disabling auto vacuum is, you know, is always good, always good to do. PG dump, you know, standard thing. You want to do it compressed if you can because that's obviously going to be faster. And on restore, you can use J to do some parallelism depending upon what your schema looks like. Um, we don't set the maintenance work memory above the default today. It's mostly due to some sort of lack in our uh, in our variables, but we're working on that. But you really want to, you know, set that to an appropriate size depending on your instance. And then the other one I really recommend is increasing the checkpoint segments and checkpoint timeout during this, and I'll show you kind of some of the results there. Now, the other thing you'll see in a lot of blogs is this next item, which is to dis disable F-Sync, or I call it the feature that says corrupt my data, please. Um, we don't believe in that. And in fact, in 9.4, we've actually turned that off um, as an allowed option in RDS because we did see customers having problems when they did this. Um, and I'll go into why we think that's not necessary. Because with the feature that allows you to turn on synchronous, turn off synchronous commit, we think you get all the benefits of disabling F-Sync without all the tragedy of having a corrupted database. And folks say, well, I'm just loading my data. It's not a problem. Once I'm done loading my data, I'll be fine. But if the machine crashes in the middle of you loading your data, you have to start all over again because you can't actually prove that you didn't have corruption somewhere in your data. Um, so, that's pretty key. So I did some tests just to show how this works. Um, this was an insert-based test, which isn't necessarily a data load per se, but you might load data that way. And in the blue, I have it with 16 checkpoint segments and the purple with 256. So we're looking at transactions per second on the axis, so bigger's better. And when we turn off F-Sync, wow, we get a big performance improvement, right? This is why a lot of people recommended this, because you get almost twice as much throughput. But guess what? If you turn that back on and you disable synchronous commit, it's even faster, which is kind of interesting. Now, what if you disable both? That's kind of the obvious question. You get a slight bit of improvement over, especially on the 256 segments, but look at the difference. It's 4%. And you really got 104% just by turning off synchronous commit. So if that's you know, what you're doing, you really want to think about, is, was, is it really worth you know, 4% improvement to have corruption possibly happen in my database? We don't think so. Now people will say, what about bulk loading of data? Well, bulk loading of data has less sort of commits typically in how you do it. So F-Sync doesn't play as much of a, a role, but it still has some. So here I'm testing a load time, so shorter is better, so it's time in seconds. I'm loading two gig of data, 
the blue again with 16 segments, purple with, uh, with 256, and I have them both on. Now see the big dramatic change when we go to 256 segments, how much improvement? We, you know, we got at least a 20, 30% improvement by just changing the checkpoint segments. When we turn F-Sync off, notice we get a big improvement on the 16, but you probably weren't gonna run that way anyway, and the 256 only goes down by a little bit. Synchronous commit, almost the same number with 256, so equal. And again, both off, we see a small minor improvement. Again, 3%, almost within the range of, you know, kind of testing. So, I mean, I did repeat these, so I do believe it's faster, but, you know, it's not significant. What about on index build? Another thing you have to do when you load data, right? Well, in this case, again, time and minutes, so we want shorter to be better. I started, I just did the, the left-hand side, which is f-sync equals one. So f-sync's on, synchronous commits off, and then on the other side, we have both of them off. In the blue, we start with a, the default on maintenance memory, maintenance work memory, 16 meg, and a small amount of share or checkpoint segments of 16. We see that we don't really have any difference between the two of them, almost equal. When we increase the maintenance work memory to a gig, we actually get the bigger change, right? So this is, you know, you really want to understand your parameters for what you're trying to do and see which ones help the most. And again, if we go and add checkpoint segments up to 1024, we get a further reduction in time, right? So these are the kind of changes that you want to make as opposed to turning F-Sync off. Now, sort of a follow-on to this, I was kind of like, well, how much memory should you use to build that index, right? So I ran a little test, which really has nothing to do with F-Sync, but it was just more of interest. I started again with the 16, and you saw that took 29 minutes. And then I went to four gig, and I only got 20, eight minutes. I only got a minute back. I was like, well, this is very strange. Now, again, I had a lot of I.O. capability on this box, so, you know, it's pretty good. But then when I use a gig, I get a faster time. And when I actually did 512, you know, I got a better time. Now, I didn't dig into this, you know, a lot, and you know, it's all going to depend on your configuration, but what it tells you is you want to test these parameter changes a lot. <clears throat> and the one of the nice things about RDS is it's super simple to go take a snapshot, a copy of your database, fire it up on another box, maybe a different size one, and change your parameters and play around and do some testing. And like when I do testing, I might even like have 10 boxes running at once, all doing just different variables to see what, what is the best uh, option. And you can do that in one hour. So you can get all your testing done and get back to like doing what you want to do. So the other thing that we see that's really interesting is customers having issues with vacuuming and not really understanding how it affects their instances. And one of the first ones that we ran into was a customer did a big data load, and then they were running read-only workload against that. And this is a test that sort of shows the same thing. So we have transaction or I operates on the left-hand side and CPU on the right. And you can see that sort of green line is our read IOPS, or sorry, write IOPS, and the orange line is CPU. So I start this test going, I get 21,000 TPS, pretty impressive. But I'm like, wow, I'm doing more than 5,000 write IOPS, but I'm only doing read transactions. What's going on? Well, when we did that data load with Postgres, it loads data into the blocks, but it doesn't clear everything. So it doesn't know that the transactions are done. So as you're randomly touching them, it's writing them out. So this has an impact on your performance. So I stop the test, and you can see in the middle box there, I run a vacuum. So I'm doing lots of writing. It's basically writing out all those blocks. Now they're nice and clean. So then we start the test again. Notice we no longer have that high level of write IOPS anymore. And we're getting 45,000 transactions per second because we're not having to rewrite those blocks as we're reading them, right? So that's one of those interesting things with Postgres that a lot of people don't understand is that there are these kind of things that happen with vacuum and you have to really understand what's going on with your system. So, you know, the typical vacuum parameters that people think about, there's the threshold and the scale factor. And really, you want to tune these to how much change you have in your data and the size of things. We go with a slightly modified set of defaults, but in general, it's, it's pretty, you know, pretty normal. But depending on your workload, you may want to change those. And then the other one is, you need to make sure vacuum is doing enough work each time it runs to get through your whole database. Because if you don't, you're going to get a transaction ID wraparound. Now, how many people know what that is? How many people have had that happen to their database? Yeah, that is not a fun experience. You're basically down. You're in single user mode until you get this fixed. Um, so 
if vacuum doesn't get through your tables, when you run out of transaction IDs and you need to start reusing them, it'll basically go into this state. Um, and we've had a number of customers that have this has happened to, even when auto vacuum is turned on because of locking or other issues, right? Um, I think one person was telling us that they had a customer that uh, on a on-premise one where they were killing the auto vacuum with a script and wondering why they uh, ran out of transaction IDs. With, so you control this with like max workers. So that's how many basically you know, processes you have doing vacuum at a time. Nap time is every time it finishes with a table, it basically is going to nap. So if you set that to a day, you're not going to get a lot of vacuuming done, right? Because it's going to just skip along. And then the nice thing about vacuum is it's got these cost sort of modifiers in it so that you can do it gently, you know, depending on, you know, for some form of gently, where every time it has to vacuum a row or a block, I should say, it has to read that into memory if it's not. And if it's in memory, it's cheaper, right? So there's a cost difference. And there's a cost limit you can set and say, every time you hit that, you've done this much work, sleep a little bit, right? So let's say all of your blocks are on disk and you're going at vacuum too hard and you're causing a lot of I.O. for your system, you could increase the delay, right? And then it's going to sleep a little more between those or, you know, lower the limit. So you've got a lot of kind of variables to work with. But the thing you need to do is you need to be querying your, uh, your database to make sure that you're not going to get transaction ID wraparound and that you're vacuuming at sort of the correct rate. And there's a number of talks and I think Gabriel has one and a few other people have one that sort of talk about this and I know Josh has blogged about it uh, a number of times and you know how to look at sort of where you are on that. One of the other questions we get is you know how do I get data in and out? Well one of the nice ways since 935 that we support is the Postgres FDW which comes you know with the with the base engine. So instead of just connecting to a regular another Postgres instance of RDS or an on-premise one I thought well you know Redshift is an older but still a, a, a Postgres front end it's an 8 version, I think 8.3 something is their front end. So I thought well, what will be interesting is, is to connect to it and just show that as an example. So now you need to be the RDS super user if you're going to do this, which is the sort of equivalent to super user to be able to create the extension, but you can grant that to whoever you want. You do the create extension and then you create a server and as you can see in the server name here it's redshift.amazonaws.com and they've got their 5439 port which always messes me up because I'm always like putting in 3.2 and go, oh I can't connect. Um, and then you create your user, you create your table, and you can see I'm doing a count out of that table, and I can select from it. And what's really cool is I can insert into it. So you can actually use, you know, this to combine multiple databases. You could have your analytics in, let's say, Redshift, and you could then select and have people pulling data from Redshift as well from your, uh, from your actual RDS Postgres instance. Now again, because it's an older version, there may be some incompatibilities. I haven't tested the full scope of, of everything that's possible. but it does point out an interesting way to get data in and out of uh, something like RDS. One of the other changes that we made in the 9.3.5 and you know continues with 9.3.6 and 9.4.1 is the support of the session replication role parameter. Um, so if you can imagine you had two databases where you'd kind of wired up triggers on tables so they would insert into the opposite tables and that's sort of what I'm depicting here, right? So if you have that and you did an insert into one of them, what's going to happen is that insert's going to hit that trigger, it's going to insert into the table, and it's going to flow around to the other table. And then it's going to hit the trigger, and it's going to come back. And this loop would just continue basically forever, right? Or if you had a, you know, a primary key on that, you'd get a violation, right? Um, so the session replication rule allows you to build replication models around triggers to say, you know, don't fire in these certain conditions, right? So it's used by a lot of the replication tools that have been built. Um, to you know, support this. So with the addition of this, we now support some of those tools. And I'm not an expert by any means on any of these tools, but I just set up Bricardo as an example to show that this could be done. And Bricardo requires uh, PL Perl U, the unsafe one. So we don't support that directly in RDS. But you can install this on an on-premise or EC2 instance and configure it, and you can talk to an RDS instance. And by doing that, you can replicate in or out or both ways if you really want to between Picardo and RDS. So this is another possible way to migrate data in or just refresh data to, to on-premise. What's really interesting is if you wanted to do multi-master between RDS, which I don't necessarily advise, you could do it through Picardo because you know, it's basically reaching out and talking. And this does work, but you know, it's not a recommended thing, but it just shows you the possibilities of the session replication role and some of the tool chain that like use that. So that's now possible to do 
Um, and like I said, we haven't looked at all the tools, so I, I can't speak to them. But if you do use one of these tools and it's not working how you want with RDS, we'd love to hear about it so that we can go figure out if there's things that we can change to make sure it's you know, more compatible with, uh, with that tooling. So let's move on to talk about sort of scale and availability with RDS and the things we've changed. So the big thing that we released in 9.3.5 was support for read replicas. And I mean, these are basically you know, standard Postgres replication. So what we had before that was we had what we call multi-AZ. So this is synchronous replication with very fast failover. And because it's synchronous, you're not gonna lose data when you fail over, right? You don't have to make that choice of should I fail over and you know, lose you know, a couple minutes of data or should I wait for my machine to come back up? So this is what we really recommend as kind of the primary method for availability. But um, there are some cases where you can use read replicas to enhance your availability. So we use asynchronous Postgres replication in streaming mode to be able to support read replicas. Um, by default, you can get five, up to five per instance, but that's just a, you know, a limit that we have set. If you need more, we can do more. We've had some customers ask for that. So let's say you have a blogging application. You can basically split that application into two sides. One where the people writing the blogs need to write and read the things that they wrote. And then there's just all the people reading your blog, right? They don't need to change anything per se. So if you split those into two, um, then, then you get, um, <laughs> sorry, a little disconcerting. The, um, you, get, you can split the eventual consistent stuff and you can see that that's in the purple. And that can be directed to your read replicas. Meanwhile, the, the blog writers can go to the primary, right? So let's say that instance fails, that machine fails that you're running on. What we're gonna do is we're gonna promote that secondary to be a primary and we're gonna fail over to it. And this process takes about a minute in total, including DNS propagation and everything. So while that's happening, if you have read replicas, right, your blog is still up from a read perspective. So you can still be having read availability that's even higher than your write availability, right? And then once we finish failing over, like I said, it takes a minute, then you're back and you can start writing again, right? So there's ways to sort of use read replicas to enhance the availability of your system if you can kind of do these kind of splits between reading and writing. Um, you know, and we, this is very, very common on, uh, you know, in MySQL, and we see a lot of this in RDS with that. And I think uh, obviously read replicas are still newer for Postgres, so I don't know if it's quite as common. The other thing you can do is if you need to upgrade your, you know, primary um, for some reason or do some maintenance, again, you have read availability. And because you can have multiples of the read replicas, you can take them down one at a time and do changes and still have a whole fleet of them up, right? So that's, that's very useful. Now, the other thing, of course, that's usable for read replicas is scaling, essentially being able to scale your read load. So if you have your application, again, talking to your primary, again, we recommend having multi-AZ across multiple availability zones. But if you put your application uh, web servers, let's say in each of the availability zones here, and I just call them fake AZ1, AZ2, and AZ3, you know, they're all pointing back to the primary. Latency is pretty good, but it could be better for some of your reads if you put read replicas in each of those zones, and then you can scale up, and you get slightly better latency for your reads, right? Because you're not having to go between data centers. It's still probably like you know a millisecond, but it does matter. So this again is a very common you know practice that we see. And one of the questions I get from a lot of people is like, how do I think about scaling up with read replicas? So I have split my application. You know, how much scale can I get? And I use this kind of this little diagram to show that. So let's say we had a box and it's completely utilized, doing 90% read and 10% writes. Well, let's say we go shard that out and we put, or it's not shard that out, we make read replicas and we you know, split all the read traffic out to those four replicas. So we haven't scaled up yet. All we've done is moved the data around, right? So what's not necessarily intuitive to people is the writes still have to go to all the replicas, right? Because you're transferring the data there, it has to be applied. So that workload doesn't go away. Now, I mean, you save some on the parsing and you know, the, the running of stuff, but it's still an overhead, especially from an IO perspective. But you can move all the reads. So now you can see instead of having 90% reads on the primary, we only have 10%. We probably still have a few that need to have consistent reads. So now we can scale up, right? You know, we can add 2x scale. And we see that the writes, again, they go to everywhere. So in this example, we're getting at least 3x scale because we're only doing 10% of writes. So this graph basically tries to illustrate that, you know, if you have very high write rates, so the yellow there, 50%, it's not going to scale well with read replicas, right? Uh, you're going to use 32 nodes to get 2x scaling, 
probably not a very cost-effective solution for your company. Your boss probably wouldn't be very happy with you if you suggested this. And the 10% one that I show you gets, you know, up to 32 nodes can scale up to 8x. But most people actually even have higher, you know, read rates, like in the 99, 99.9%, and can get, you know, tremendous scale. We've seen people scale up quite high on this. And I actually, as a test, I ran with um, 15 R3 at Excels, that's our biggest box, 256 gig of RAM, lots of processors. I ran 15 of those replicas off of one uh, master, no problem, kept up fine. It was doing, I think, like 30,000 TPS on writes, you know, worked perfectly fine, no problems. And, you know, the replication delay was in the, you know, tens of milliseconds to get to, this, to, the, to the replica. So very nice model, love the Postgres replication, very solid. Um, now, one of the things that's a little different about RDS, because when people think about promoting sort of a read replica, there's, you know, what happens to the rest of my stuff when I do that, right? So we're back to that same model where we have our primary and our secondary, we're doing multi-AZ, and we have a bunch of read replicas. So that re replica in AZ3, let's say I wanted to make it a reporting one, just because I'm like, okay, I need a box, and I just want to use it for a while, but I want to make changes. So maybe I carve that off. So I just say promote in our RDS APIs, and it becomes a new primary. And at that point, your application can start doing writes to it and whatever it wants. If you want to make this multi-AZ, you can now. You can have read replicas off of it. But notice how nothing changed in the picture from before, right? It's all exactly the same. So you don't, none of your other replicas follow it or do anything like that. It just stays exactly as you are. So that's a little different than some, some methods that people use. So there's a bunch of questions that we get with read replicas about how to configure them, how to think about them. And one of the first things that we talk to customers about is wall keep segments. So we're using streaming replication. The primary is just feeding you know, the wall information as it gets it over to the replica, right? So very little lag, works great. But what happens when you have like a little bit of a network blip and that streaming replication is gone for a little bit, right? You start to accumulate logs you know, that haven't been replicated on the primary. And this will basically occur until you hit the wall keep segment limit, right? So if you set it to 99, at some point, it's going to start removing things. But as part of RDS, we do backup and recovery for you, and we're loading the logs every five minutes up into S3, or quicker as you generate them. So that guy's being copied up. So even if it's going to be removed on the primary, it's not a problem. We have it. So we can feed that to the replica, and we can do you know, archive log-based uh, apply to catch the replica back up and keep it current, even if streaming's broken. And so this is if, you know, if you have a very large replica, this is, you know, good because you don't want to have to recreate it. Uh, and then once, once it catches up, it just starts streaming again once the network's working again. So if you do have those kind of interruptions. So wall keep segments is not super critical because we do do this pull from S3. But obviously when you're applying from a log versus streaming, there's a little more delay, right? Because it's sort of a little more herky-jerky. Um, so you want to set wall keep segments to a reasonable size so you don't have a problem with, uh, you know, this happening very often. But on the other hand, if you make it huge, then you're wasting a lot of space on your instance that you otherwise don't need. So, you know, there's a balance there. So one of the other interesting ones is thinking about how sort of vacuum affects running queries on your secondaries, right, on your read replicas. So in this case, I have a table T1. It's got a row in there called A, you know, for the primary key, and it's got some data called foo on, on one of the columns. So on the replica, I start a query that says select star from T1. No one's ever done one without a where clause, right? You never had any of your users do that. So it's a huge table. It's going to run for, you know, hours or something. And meanwhile, your application updates that table and sets the, you know, new value for that primary key. So in Postgres, we end up with a new row in the database, right? And the old one, you know, is still sitting there. It's all great. This thing's going to get replicated down to the replica, but it's not going to be seen by the new you know, query because it was already running, so it's all good, the normal MVCC stuff. But someone runs a vacuum or auto vacuum runs on the primary, right? Well, guess what's going to happen? It's vacuuming out that old record. Not a problem, but that gets replicated. And what you get is this. You get your session killed. So it's going to terminate it when there's a conflict with recovery. Because essentially what's happened is you've lost the snapshot data that you were using for your session, right? So this is pretty critical depending on how you want to use your replicas. I mean, if you all have very small, fast transactions, you know, read selects is not going to be much of a problem. But it can be. So Postgres gives you four, count them, four <laughs> different ways to, to work with this. 
So there's the vacuum deferred cleanup age, and there's two delays and one feedback. And I'll go through each of those. So the vacuum deferred cleanup age, it's set on the primary. We, the default is zero, and that's what we set it to in RDS. And it's in the number of transactions you'd like to delay by. And we'll see why that's important. So let's say you're doing transaction one, you insert some data, transaction two, you're updating, and so on. You know, and so you keep doing this, lots of transactions. You hit transaction six. Now let's say on your replica, it's reading and it needs transaction four, right? Well, that's fine. It should be available, except for if you vacuum, right? All of those old records are going to get removed because no one needs them on the primary. So you could set vacuum deferred cleanup age, in this example, to two, which means keep two transactions. Now this, of course, is across the entire you know, cluster, so it's not, uh, it's not like per table, as I'm showing this example, but I'm just trying to make it simple. And this would allow it to not vacuum out those last couple records. So this obviously is going to have an impact on how much, you know, how many old things are sitting around in your database. And it, you know, it looks like it works pretty well, but the problem is you've got to set it in a number of transactions. And how do you figure out, like you'd have to kind of be like, my transaction, my write transaction rate on my primary is X, and that turns into X number of minutes onto my secondary. So you could do that, but it's pretty complex, and it's going to be, you know, a little difficult to understand when people come and say, my query got broken, why was that? And you're like, well, because we had too many transactions going on in the primary, right? So what we see used is uh, a little more is the max standby archive delay and streaming delay. And basically these go with the various types of apply. So we use streaming replication mostly. So the default is 30 seconds, and that's what it's set to, and that's what we run with. And so you can think about it this way. When a conflicting thing comes in, you're going to delay that replication apply really for 30 seconds, right? Um, and this happens on streaming. But remember how we said we could do catch up via logs, so you'll also want to think about setting the archive delay, right? Because if we do have to go to archive, you wouldn't want to have your queries again die there, right? And you'd want to have those matching values on those because otherwise you're going to get kind of weird behavior depending on which mode you're in, right? And because it might switch back and forth, that wouldn't be good. So this one works pretty well, but again, there's a trade off, right? Because what happens when you set this to an hour? Well. Your queries are going to complete, but someone wanting current data isn't going to get it, right? So your replication delay is going to go up because you're not applying those changes, right? So new sessions coming in are going to be like, eh. The other funny thing is you, not all your sessions will see the max delay, right? When you think about this, session one comes in, it's doing something, this thing comes along that's going to break its snapshot, it starts counting for 30 seconds. But another session comes in 15 seconds after that. Well, guess what? It doesn't reset that timer, right? So 15 seconds later, bam, you've hit the 30. It's going to it's going to remove it's going to apply that and it's going to remove that data. And your second session is going to fail, right? So essentially, you would have only seen like on that session 15 seconds of of delay, right? So this one's a little tricky in that as well. So you know, if you only have one long running thing you know, or all of your things are more or less the same time, then it's probably fine, but it can, it can be a little tricky to set. The other one that's kind of really useful is hot standby feedback. And so we get the same picture again, and the way to think about this is like, it's on the replica, and it's off by default in our configuration as well as just in Postgres in general. Um, it gives basically a backwards channel from the read replica to the primary to send information about what's going on. And if you think about it this way, let's say you have a select on the replica. Now, if that select would have been running on the primary, vacuum would not re remove rows that were needed for that select, right? That's how Postgres works. It's wonderful, right? It's how it has that consistent view. Well, this feedback basically tells the primary that same information to make it almost think, in a you know, virtual ma manner, that you're running that query on the primary, right? So it's going to do the exact same thing that it would on the primary. It would block vacuum. So if vacuum starts up, it's going to say, oh, no. There's a session using that data. I'm not going to do anything, right? Your query will finish. Now, again, there's a catch on hot standby feedback. Because it's part of sort of the streaming replication protocol, it has to be able to talk to the primary, right? If the network breaks, well, guess what? Auto vacuum is not getting any feedback that there's sessions going on, and it will start vacuuming. And because 
we do do a apply of logs. Uh, that vacuum will go through the logs and will get be applied onto the read replica and it would break your, your session, right? So what's usually recommended is a combination of both hot standby feedback and some of the delay settings in combination to really meet whatever needs you have for replicas. So that one's just, you know, it's, you've got to kind of understand what your application's doing and then, you know, sort of tailor it. But hopefully that kind of helps with, with understanding that. When you get a conflict, you can actually see these. There's a PGStat database conflicts table. Um, in this case, you can see I had a snapshot conflict where basically it had removed the snapshot that my session needed and I got that error and this is what happens in this table. So, you know, pretty reasonable. We also support, obviously, with replication, you can look at the PGStat replication view. And you can actually see if you're, you know, if you're in streaming mode, what mode you're in uh, when you're on your, on your replicas. So that's nice and handy. Um, we do provide uh, a replication leg uh, metric in CloudWatch. I should put a, a graph in here of that. Um, that just shows, you know, where you are behind. One of the interesting things about Postgres is, you know, the typical way to measure replication leg is to look at the last transaction that was applied. So if there's no transactions going on, you know, you'll get a lag up to that, to the last point. We do a little heartbeat one every five minutes, so, you know, you might see five minute replication lag, and then as soon as you start doing transactions, you won't see any, right? And typically you'll see less than a second in, in most of our situations, so. The other thing that we added in uh, 9.3.5 <clears throat> was support for PG stat statements. How many people use this, uh, this extension? Or shared libraries, I should say, okay, good. So you have to go in, we don't load it by default because we have some very small instances and we don't wanna necessarily like, you know, add extra load to every customer, but you can go into your parameter groups in RDS and you can add the PG stat statements to your shared preload libraries, and then you can create the extension if you want, and you, you, know, you get that good data that shows you exactly what's going on. And a number of our customers sort of collect this data and stick it somewhere so they can see it you know, on a time basis, so that's super useful. Other things that we did in 9.3.5 and 9.3.6, um, we added support, uh, and again, this goes on for 9.4. We added support for PLV8, the V8 JavaScript engine. Um, we had a couple customers that said, you know, we really need the test parser extension. Um, we had left it off uh, because we were, you know, we read the documentation and we went, I don't know what this, this, it's just like, but they'd used it for something and they said they needed it, so it's part of the, you know, contrib, we threw it in. Um, we uh, had a new PostGIS version that we uh, added uh, support for grid shift files. And then, um, as I said, now shared preload libraries, we can add things to that. Currently, we only have the one, which is PG stat statements. But in the future, if we find other ones that we think are useful or if the customers tell us, we'll be able to add those. So that's sort of the you know, deep Postgres stuff that you know, we've done in the last little while. But one of the other interesting ones that I wanted to talk about was sort of some of the other exciting stuff that's sort of coming out of AWS and is in RDS, which is really burst mode computing which I think is quite novel because it's definitely something different than most people run on premise. And we currently have two offerings in that. One is around IO capabilities. We have what we call GP2 or general purpose two uh, EBS volumes. So they're SSD based like our provisioned IOPS, but instead of saying I want a thousand IOPS, you get three IOs per gigabyte. So if you buy hundred gigabytes in a volume, you get 300 IOPS guaranteed. Now, if you don't use those 300 IOPS, they basically build up and then you can use them later. And you can burst up to at least 3,000 or higher on RDS because we, have, we use multiple volumes on very large instances, so you, you get actually even higher bursts. And that's really useful for variable workloads, and I'll show you some graphs on that. And on the other side, from a compute basis, we now have the T2 line, and we have micros, small and mediums, that do the same thing. They have burst. You get CPU credits you know, every minute, and they add up, and then you can use them within a 24 hour period. And you know, once you've used them all up, you go down to the base level. Now the nice thing about the T2 is that we actually have CloudWatch metrics for these. So you can actually see, hey, how much credit do I have left? How am I burning it? And we're pushing the EBS folks to do the same thing with the GP2 stuff because we've had a lot of customers kind of go, I don't really know where I am on, uh, on my usage. And you know, obviously we want them to be able to see that. So how does this look in practice? So I ran a benchmark, read-only workload, and uh, you can see that I have CPU and, uh, and uh, in the orange, and the blue is read IOPS. So I started running. 
and I got 6,000 transactions per second. And then we, uh, we get throttled down here. So we get down to about uh, 3,800 TPS. And that's because we used up all of our GP2 credits. So we were doing a lot of IO, and you can see the kind of dramatic drop. And then we, get, we run for quite a while, and then we drop again down to 2,200 TPS uh, because we've exhausted the T2 credits. So you can see it's pretty, you know, in this kind of test, it's pretty obvious what's going on. But this is actually how you can see it in, for the T2s, the credits, you can see that nice orange line as it goes down, it's the credit balance, right? And it'll decrease over time as you use up your credits. And when it hits a zero, you get throttled to your minimum and you can see the drop in my performance of how much CPU I was using, right? So why is this important? Well, it's all about price performance. So I went and looked at sort of burst mode versus some of our classic models and some of our provisioned I.O. Uh, systems that our customers use today. Just did a nice simple test, 20 gig of data, read workload, transactions per second on the vertical axis, and hours on the bottom. So I started with one of our classic instances, which was an M1 medium, and um, 20 gig or 200 gig of standard storage. So this is the older EBS magnetic storage. Comes in at just about 58 cents an hour, and it does about 1,200 TPS. Not bad, not bad. Very consistent, right? So let's go and pick a newer machine, an M3 medium. So same amount of memory. And this is a fairly heavy, I mean, because we don't have a lot of RAM, so it, it does a lot of reads. Um, we did 200 gigabytes of storage again, but this time we did provision IOPS. And those cost more, but you can see that we almost doubled our performance, right? And we saved money because we needed a lot more resources to run this, right? And we basically paid for them. So a little more efficient CPU and a lot more IO. I thought, well, OK, this is good. But I also noticed the M3 medium was tapped out on CPU. So I thought, well, what happens if I go with like an M3 large, which has twice as much memory, twice as much CPU? Well, I only got a slight improvement because guess what? I had the same amount of IOPS. And this test is very IOP centric, right? I mean, and it's specific to this one. But even in this, notice that we went from about 2,500 to 3,000 transactions per second, right? So we got a good, that's a decent bump, right? And we only went up in 10 cents an hour. So it might be worth your while. But so this is all good. But now let's talk about the burst mode ones. So we went and got an M3 or a T2 medium, same amount of RAM, right? But we went with 200 gigs of GP2 storage. Now you'll see right off the bat, we're getting amazing performance, 3,500 TPS, right? But it only lasts for two hours because essentially we ran out of GP2 credits and we got throttled. Man, and you can, you know, because we're only got 200 gigs, so we got 600 IOPS. So it's not really a fair comparison, right? 600 IOPS versus something that had 2,000. But look at the cost, you know, 10 cents an hour, 11 cents an hour. So if you only needed it for a couple hours a day, this is a great value. You'd save yourself a huge amount of money. But I thought, hey, why don't we just throw a little more space at this to get a few more IOPS and see how that works? So I take a T2 medium again, but I do a terabyte of GP2. So look at that result, 6,000 transactions per second, right? Because now we have 3,000 IOPS guaranteed, plus we can burst, right? So we've got more baseline than I had before, and it's 23 and basically 23 and a half cents an hour. So even when we're throttled right at the end, now at this point, we've hit the T2 limit, so we're throttled on both CPU and IOPS, right? But we're still getting almost the same amount as the M3 medium, right? And this is 17, 18 hours later, and it's half, you know, about right around, you know, a little more than half the cost. So it shows the economics of these models, and I think you're gonna to continue to see a lot more of this kind of work from us in the future. And so, you know, if you can think about when you design your applications and your database to kind of take advantage of these things, you can really save a lot of money. Now, GP2 in general, I would just, you know, it's a great solution for test and for sort of, you know, medium level um, uh, of IOPS because the, the cost, you know, model is so much better. So I, I recommend it to all my customers, you know, depending on their workload. So with that, I'll wrap up and I'll take questions uh, on uh, anything and, you know, happy to answer on RDS in general or Postgres, you know, RDS. Um, yes, Jeff. Are you supporting the replication slots for the Red Bull instances? The question was, are we supporting replication slots? Uh, not currently. Uh, it's something that we're, uh, we're looking at. Uh, it does change a little bit of, uh, you know, 
how many logs end up on the host, and so we're trying to understand how to do that in a way that will, will be understandable for our customers so that they know, you know, that there's a lot of space possibly in use uh, if they create slots. So that's something we're definitely looking into. Ed? Uh, the question was, have I been able to tune auto vacuum settings so that you don't have to do vacuum fulls? Um, well, we work with customers, but every customer is sort of unique for us. So, I mean, I, I can't specifically say that we've kind of gotten to a point where we could do that. Like, I can't say I could do that for everyone. I mean, most of our customers are pretty happy with how their vacuum stuff works, but, you know, it's really case by case. Over there. Right, so the question is, uh, what is there a priority for doing cross-region read replicas with Postgres? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, our customers have asked us a lot for that. It's definitely, uh, you know, for me, what we have with MySQL is what I consider sort of a minimally viable product, you know, from, a, from an overall perspective. And so that's kind of the goal for all of our engines, um, is to have sort of the same functionality, including things like cross-region, because and we get a lot of customers asking about it for uh, DR purposes, which I assume is what you're looking for. Yeah, so it's definitely something that we want to we want to do. We could talk more offline on sort of when that might happen. Um, do we have any uh, statistics on uh, adoption on 9.4 kind of versus 9.3? Um, well, we only launched last week, so it's uh, it's quite early. Uh, but we did see a lot of crates. Uh, you know, we were seeing more crates, I would say, on 9.4 on those days than we were on 9.3. Um, but, you know, obviously there's just a lot of enthusiasm around testing and, you know, checking it out. So I think it's still early to know. But typically what we see in our RDS engines is, uh, you know, we, we don't make the new major version the default for a little while because uh, we want to make sure everything's working really well with it. But once we do, most people just then pick that as the default. So then, you know... Uh, the customers tend to move up pretty rapidly. It's one of the things that we sort of encourage, right, is, uh, you know, to move along with both minor and major versions when possible. Other questions? No? Yes? Coming back to this uh, wall file uh, yep. question, so are, are there a limit on the size of walls that one can support? Uh, you mean on the wall keep segments? Uh, no. I mean, it's the Postgres maximum. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's, you, could, you could fill up your entire, like, three terabytes, I think, with wall files if you wanted to. Um, I've set it to in the tens of thousands uh, easily um, and had no problems, so. But the uh, wall file storage is uh, the same storage as the... Uh, yes. Yeah, so all the, all, we use one shared storage because it's kind of too hard to explain to people, like, oh, hey, you only have this much space for wall or, you know, so that way it's, uh, you know, it's pretty understandable. Any other questions in the back? You mentioned that for larger volumes, it uses, uh, or larger data sizes, it uses multiple volumes. Yes. Is it going to continue to do that with the release of 16 terabyte PDF volume classes? Um, yes and no. Um, uh, EBS does not currently support as many IOPS as we do, uh, so we're going to continue to do some of that. Uh, we're working with them to try to get to closure on how we do things uh, uh, soon. But yeah, at some point, uh, we will probably be more following their model. Um, so that's why we don't advertise, you know, we only say you can burst above 3,000 because at some point it probably will, uh, it probably will change to being, you know, their model. So, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so all these cost analysis. Yep. Right. The question is, do we really have tools around, you know, kind of figuring out what your optimal sizing is? Um, not really direct ones. I mean, we have pricing calculators that obviously you can kind of throw, you know, what you might use in. And we provide CloudWatch metrics to look at, you know, what are you doing for IOPS, how much, you know, memory you're using, how much CPU. But we don't have anything that integrates that all together to give you kind of a, you know, 
hey, you, you could be running on a smaller instance or maybe you might need a larger one. It's definitely something I think that, you know, over time we'll look into kind of trying to give more advice, but that's, that's where we are today. Sure. So the question is, uh, what what kind of model do we use for uh, um, for promotion? So just to just to clarify, um, our multi EZ is not using uh, Postgres replication; it's synchronous, and we do we do use a quorum model to to basically do that. Um, you know, sta pretty standard uh, standard model uh, for when people promote read replicas. That's just a it's an asynchronous promotion. So there's no you know there's no kind of quorum or anything done. You just if you tell us to promote it, we'll promote it, and you know. Good luck. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the thing with asynchronous replication. It's why we, you know, we offer the feature because many people, we have gaming customers and other customers who are like, I don't mind losing a few minutes of data, and they like that model. But for many of our customers that say, you know, I run a transactional system, I can't afford to lose anything, uh, we believe synchronous replication with sort of that model is the, is the right way to go. Anyone else? Yes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, I was waiting for someone to ask it. Right. Yes. Um, saw that. Um, yeah. The um, yes, we do plan on supporting uh, major version upgrade. Again, it's one of the core features that we believe in. Um, it's. We didn't want to wait on 9.4 before having that done, but because um, you know a lot of people just want to test right now. But as it turns out, a lot of people want to really upgrade their database right now. So um, it's definitely something that uh, you know we're working on. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we'll do. No, why not, why not support the upgrade? Sorry. No, no, we will. No, that that is well. That, I mean, that's what. It, sorry. Our major version upgrade will be using. Uh, PG upgrade. Sorry, to, not to be clear. Yes, it'll be just it'll be the normal PG upgrade process, with just the automation of it and making sure it all you know works perfectly. So, other questions? Don't see any more hands? Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we have a booth downstairs. I'll be around uh, you know for the rest of the the week. If you have questions, uh, any of us you can see us in the black t-shirts. We're happy to answer any questions about you know, RDS, AWS, any of the kind of stuff. We, we know a lot about EC2 and EBS and some of the other things, not everything about AWS, but happy to, you know, answer any of those questions as well. And we have shirts down at the booth, so if you want a shirt, come get it.